to introduce my good friend, uh, Dennis Keating. Dennis pastored Emmanuel Faith in Escondido for 30 years. Yeah, long time. <laughs> uh, he'll tell us maybe some about that. Uh, and retired from that so he could help people like us a couple years ago. And he is raring to go to tell us how to have the best new year ever. Would you all give Dennis a wonderful new song welcome? I love you, brother. Thank you Thank so you much well. for making yourself available to us. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm a Bible guy, so let's open our Bibles to Mark chapter 6. If you didn't bring a Bible, the, if you got a phone or a Bible app or some kind of tablet or something, Mark chapter 6. I'm honored to be back with you this last day of 2023, a very forgettable year. Let's just say that out loud. And uh, I'm honored to come and be a part of it. I'd like to start our time together just asking a quick question of you. Do you think that experiencing a miracle would increase your faith? What do you think? If you, if you experience, they're called miracles because they don't happen very often. Otherwise, they'd be called normals or averages. But they're miracles. Not, not many people get them. But if you had one, do you think that it would increase your faith? Typically, we think yes, but it's really interesting in our text of study this morning, what we're going to see is that the answer is uh, sometimes. Just because you experience some astounding reality, God in your life, doesn't mean that your faith is going to skyrocket. Now, why is that the case? Well, in Mark chapter 6, we're going to get some answers. But before we get that answer, I want to just set the quick context for you about the gospel of Mark. Knowing the a context of Bible verses is really, really important. Uh, in the gospel of Mark, his whole purpose is established in chapter 1 and verse 1. And it just says it's all about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. See this verse that's up on the screen here? It's the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So Mark just throws it out there just right from the very, very beginning. And so what he's writing about is he's writing about Jesus. That was his human name. That's what his mom would have called him. His dad would have called him. He had brothers. He had sisters, all of his buddies. Hey, Jesus, that was his human name. Christ is the messianic title. It identifies him as the promised coming king of the nation of Israel. A son of God is obviously a clear reference to his divine nature. So from the very outset, Mark just wants you to know his whole writing is all about Jesus Christ, the son of God. And with that established, he then spends 16 chapters proving it. And he does that by listing miracle after miracle after miracle that Jesus performed. If you ever want to study the actions of Jesus, read the Gospel of Mark. Because Mark's whole writing is to show people that Jesus has awesome power. And ha he has the absolute authority to do whatever is required to accomplish God's will and God's plan for our individual lives. And so with that stated here, in chapter 6, what we're going to see are two of the best known miracles that Jesus ever performed, and it's going to give us this New Year's challenge. Did you come to hear from the Lord this morning? Yeah, not from me, but from the Lord this morning. Here's the message from the Lord, the challenge from the Lord. He wants us to be open to Jesus doing the impossible in your life this year. Open your heart to it. And there are two miracles that Mark chapter 6. One is going to be the feeding of 5,000 people from just five loaves and two fish. 
and the other is our Lord's walking upon the water. And both of them are simply in our Bibles to show us that our God has awesome power. And thus Mark's statement in Mark chapter 10 and verse 27, see it with me, a few things are possible with God, right? What's it say? How many things? All things. Not just a few things, not just some things, but all things are possible with God. So, as you look out to 2024, what situation is going on in your life that you don't think will ever change? No way in heaven that's ever going to be any better. Uh, what person in your life is so upside down that she or he will never be right side up ever again? We all have them. We all have impossible situations. We have to confront them, the realities of life. Sometimes there are challenges that just seem to paralyze us. And we get afraid to hope that anything could be better, that any transformation could take place. And we just think, not even God could do that. And that's why we gather together here. Because I think as we look forward to 2024, I would venture to guess that we could all use a little fresh touch from the Lord. And I think we, we could all use it as we look forward to the next 365. You know, Lord, please. Because sometimes, quite honestly, I, you, we, we all get a little stuck. And we just kind of get in the same old, same old. And I'd like for 2024 to be more better than 2023. Can I just say it that way? And so we gather together to hear from the Lord. And what the Lord is going to say to us is, be open, will you, in your heart? To God doing something new, something fresh. Maybe even the impossible. You can say it a number of different ways. In 2024, please don't be afraid to hope that life can be different. That life can be better. That's the message from the Lord to us. Okay? So, with that said, we can go home. All right? Nobody say praise the Lord, will you? Okay? But that's the message from the Lord. So when you leave here and you, somebody asks you, hey, what did the Lord say to you this morning? What's the answer? Be open in your heart. The Lord doing the impossible. I don't know how. I don't know when. I don't know where. I don't know what. But Lord, I want my heart to be open. Okay? That's the big message from the Lord. Now. What we're going to do is we're just going to go through Mark chapter 6. We'll go through it pretty quickly. And I want to tell you five reasons why your heart should be open to God doing the impossible. All right? So let's dig into our text. We're going to start in chapter 6 and verse 30. Here's the reason. Why should our hearts be open? First, because God knows what's going on in your life. He can feel your pain. He understands. He gets you right where you're at. Well, all the challenges that you face. Let's, let's see uh, in our text. Mark chapter 6, uh, verse 30. Uh, the apostles gathered together with Jesus, and they reported to him all that they had done and taught. So uh, just historically in the context, Jesus had trained them, empowered them, sent the 12 out to preach the gospel, heal the sick, cast out demons, and they had been out for weeks ministering throughout all of the villages up in the, in the area of Galilee. And they come back and they report the great things that the Lord had done, that God was at work. The challenge, it had left them totally exhausted, and the Lord knew it. 
thus, verse 31, he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest a while, for there were many people coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. That's too busy. Sometimes the ministry gets like that. Challenges get that way. And uh, I just want you to know that Jesus understood their exhaustion. He understood what they were going through. And they made plans to take a retreat together. That's what he's going to do. It just doesn't work out. Verse 32. They went away in a boat to a secluded place by themselves. All the plans, they're getting away from the people, getting away from the ministry. They head on out, verse 33. The people saw them going, and many recognized them, and ran there together on foot from all the cities, and got there ahead of them. And when Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd. When you hear the word large, uh, how many are you thinking? Conservative guess, 15,000. 15 to 20,000 people are waiting for. That's a lot of folk. I don't know how you would have felt. You were going on a retreat to get away from people. <laughs> and you land, and there's tens of thousands of people waiting to get some help from you. Here's what I want you to notice. Jesus' response, verse 34. He felt compassion for them. He steps off the boat, and immediately his heart goes out to him. Compassion. Best definition I ever heard. Compassion is your pain in my heart. And that's what Jesus felt. Why? Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Their desperation for help touched him deeply. Their need for someone to understand, for someone to have resources that they didn't have, it was so great, it, he felt it in his gut. Literally, it's in his kidneys. It's in his inner being, the way that the original language speaks of it. So, you know, what do we learn from stuff like that? When Jesus looks at me, when Jesus looks at you, he understands exactly what's going on. And he feels it. He doesn't just know it. He feels it. And I think it's an important principle that you and I, as we look forward to, with open hearts to the Lord doing something new or something fresh or even the impossible in, in our lives, in 2024, I just want you to know this key insight, this principle here, the point. It's in Jesus' heart to help you. You don't have to twist his arm. He knows the loneliness. He knows the challenges, the pressure that you feel as you look forward to it. He knows the boredom. And the scriptures just speak of it in so many different ways. And you know, one of the greatest challenges that we have, I think even in, as in the church, is that somehow we're all alone. And that nobody else really knows and nobody else really cares. And maybe not even God cares. Well, the scriptures tell us that he feels our pain in his heart. And, that, and that's the writer of the Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. That the high priest, he understands our weaknesses. He, uh, literally the Greek word is sympatheo. He sympathizes with our weaknesses. And he just totally gets it. 
And so whatever pains you might be going through, just know he, he gets it because he feels it. And he understands. He gets the battles that we all face at times, the addictions, the worry. Because our world just seems like it's gone a little crazy right now. Do you think good is going to win in the end? I don't know. And you look out and you think about some impossible scenario. Because I'm venturing to guess that some of you have got kids and grandkids. You, you raised them in the Lord. You taught them the scriptures. You did your very, very best. And your kids and your grandkids have turned away from the Lord. I was just with a friend a while back. He said a year ago, both my sons with their families were involved in church. And then something happened. He said one year ago today, now they're both divorced. They both have rejected the Lord. And he's just, I, I just, I just don't. I, I just, he's afraid to hope that something could be different. And we all go through it. And we think that nobody cares, the heartache, the hurts. And I just want you to know that Jesus knows and Jesus cares. So open your heart to it, even if it means him doing the impossible. So would you do the quick little heart check? Are you open to it? Not everybody is. And the apostles were not too thrilled with this whole process. And so our Lord needed to use his awesome power again to, secondly, Instill a new vision. Instill a new vision. What God can do in the impossible. Verse 35. When it was already quite late, his disciples came to him and said, This place is desolate. It's remote. It's already quite late. Send them away so that you may go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. So you get the picture. Ministry's going late in the afternoon, and the guys are you know, bone tired, getting a little, you know, chippy. Tell, the, tell, you know, tell these folks to leave. I'm going to go out and get some food. Call it a day. We've done enough. Send them out there. Find some grub. Verse 37. I just love this, because the Lord just never does what we want him to do, you know. But he answered them. You give them something to eat. And in the original text, the you is emphasized. You 12, you take care of this problem, will you? You go out, you feed these 15, 20,000 people. Thus their response, verse 37, they said to him, shall we go and spend 200 denarii, uh, eight, wage, eight months wages on bread and give them something to eat? Jesus, what are you saying? It's going to cost a small fortune for us to do that. Say you make five grand a, a month, ten grand a month. Well, you've dropped it. It's ten grand a month. It's going to cost us 80 grand to feed 50,000 people. You couldn't want us to do that, could you? Jesus ever ask you to do something crazy? Jesus ever ask you to do something that sounds wrong to you? Like forgiving someone who hurt you? They don't deserve forgiving, but I want you to forgive them anyway. You see, sometimes our hearts, we, we want to say that they're open, but sometimes we just need a new vision for what God wants us to do. 
because he's the God who can do the impossible in us and through us. And that's the principle. The principle that sometimes that I struggle with, especially in ministry-related stuff, I tend to focus on problems. I can kind of get stuck on that problem of what I can't do. That's the principle. The, the principle is, is, is that we, we become uh, problem-oriented, and I get a little focused on, on the scarcity principles. If I do this, I won't have enough, whereas our Lord is always looking at the potential of the problem of what he can do. And that's the circumstance that the apostles are in. He's going to use this impossible circumstance to show them his awesome power. And so he's going to move us out of our comfort zone. He's going to move us beyond what we think. Verse 38, he asks them, how many loaves do you have? Go look. And when they found out, they said, five and two fish. Why put them through the process? Because of this principle. See, nothing wrong with thinking with human wisdom. It's just that there's a divine wisdom that's greater. We have to think with certain principles to guide us and lead us. But we're part of a kingdom of God that works on completely different principles. Because it's not based upon what we can do or what we can't do. It's what he can do. That's the whole point of this. And that's, again, you need a new vision for what God can do in 2024. It's not just the same old, same old. There may be something brand new. Maybe something just very fresh. Something new that might uh, seem impossible to a, a widow or a widower. How might God use your new singleness with all the heartbreak and all the grief and all the loss? A new vision for your marriage. You've been married for 40 years, 45 years. You're comfortable with just the same old, same old. Is there something that could make it better? Again, some of you single folks just love to go out on a date in 2024. What might God do with your singleness? Do you need a new vision for New Song Church? What new things might God do at New Song 2024? See, that's why we go through these things, because it challenges us. And we think, oh, I can't do that. But he can, see. And the awesome power of the Lord, he understands what we need, because he feels what we feel. He gets us. And, and, and he wants us to look to him. Because he has the power, thirdly, to multiply limited resources. Verse 39, he commanded them all to sit down by groups on the green grass, and they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, and he took five loaves, two fish, and looking up toward heaven, he blessed food, broke the loaves, and he kept giving them to the disciples set before them. He divided up two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. They were full. And maybe one of the few times in their lives, these are a lot of poor folk. And finally, their bellies are full. Eat up, eat as much as you want. And the food just kept coming and coming and coming. So they saw the awesome power, but the real lesson was for the disciples. Verse 43, they picked up 12 full baskets of the broken pieces and also of the fish. And there were 5,000 men who ate the loaves. What, what lesson can we learn as we look forward to 2024? 
It's a profound lesson. Uh, little is much when it's placed in our Lord's hands. You understand that? That's the principle. That's the lesson. Little is much when it's placed in its hands. Can Jesus multiply your limited resources today? Come on, can he? Really? Would 2024 be a little different if you multiplied limited resources? Maybe. I don't know. It all depends on your heart. Can God make you a millionaire uh, this week? Maybe. I don't know. All I know is, is from an example like this, multiplication only happens when we take what little we have and we put it into his hands. See? What have you got? I got five loaves and I've got two fish. What good is that? Well, it's not much good for you. But for him, he can multiply those limited resources. And therefore, you take the limited resources that you have, and you have to immediately put them into his hands. Before you do anything else, take what you have and give it to him. This is yours. So whatever you want me to do, I don't know what good it's going to do. But Lord, I want to put this in your hand. And there, there's illustrations of this throughout the scriptures. If you remember, back in your Old Testament, a guy by the name of Moses, remember him? God shows up in a burning bush to Moses, who got, ran away out of Egypt. And he says, I want you to go back to Pharaoh and tell him what? Let my people go. What did Moses think of that idea? He's looking at the problem. God's got the potential of the problem. See? Moses, uh, this, isn't, this is not going to work. And, and the first thing that God says to Moses, look at this verse in, in Exodus chapter 4, up on the screen. First thing that God says to Moses. What's that in your hand? Moses says it's a stick. Throw it on the ground. Let me show you what I can do with that stick. Bam. What's in your hand? You got five loaves and two fish? You're going to have to put it into his hands. Before it's ever going to get multiplied, you're going to have to put it into his hands. I was up with a bunch of college students uh, teaching up at Calvary Chapel Bible College. And we were talking about this principle. And a uh, young couple, they've been married for a couple, three months. They said, Dennis, what do, what, what do we do when we're poor? And we don't have much. And I said to him, whatever you got, you're going to have to put into his hands. And if you're going to give something, you, I'm just a big believer that everybody gives something. It's between you and God as to the amount. Because everybody's got different amounts. You know, but you can throw a buck in the, in the basket, can't you? You think, well, what good will that do? <laughs> Listen, he can multiply <laughs> limited resources. The issue is not the amount that you give, but your heart. Do you want to give it? Then give it. You don't want to give it? Don't give it. <laughs> you know? But if you want to, you'd be astounded what God can do with five loaves and two fish. So I do this with my problems. Any of you have any problems? 
Come on, I'm going to start bleeding up here in front of you, you know? We're, we're, we're all in this together, aren't we? You know what I have to do? I have to do this. I was doing this at my desk the other day. The worry and frustration and the anxiousness. I look out at this year and all the challenges that I have. And what I have to do is I have to take my hands and put them out in front of me. And i got to let go. I don't know if this helps you at all. But sometimes just doing something. The frustration and despair, maybe the disappointments that go on in life. Lord, I'm going to put these into your hands. Try it. See if it helps. He can do the impossible. Is your heart open to it? He knows. He has a vision for it. He has a power for it. For it. Our heart should be open because he can empower the resisting of temptation. All right, I've got to wrap up here. I'm going to go too long here, Hal. <clears throat> okay. Pastor said it was okay. Mark doesn't record what happens after the feeding of the 5,000. But uh, John does. And... Uh, after the fifteen to 20,000, the 5,000 men, their families were fed. Look what happens. Here's John chapter 6. See this verse that's up on the screen. When the people saw the sign which Jesus had performed, in the context it's the multiplying of the food. When, when they saw the sign which, which Jesus had performed, they said, this is truly the prophet which is to, which, which is to come into the world. Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15 uh, prophesied and foretold that uh, the Messiah would be like a prophet like he was and that he would come and all the people were looking for the prophet they say this is the prophet they got that part right but notice what they do then so Jesus perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by what's the word by force to make him what king. I don't know whether you knew that or not. Uh, 5,000 men is the starting point of a pretty good army. And what all these people wanted was the Messiah who was going to rule over a kingdom, which meant they were going to toss Rome's yoke of oppression off of their, from around their neck. And now they're starting to feel this messianic revolution that called for military arms. And they're going to take Jesus by force and make him king. Jesus wants nothing to do with that. Not because it's not going to happen one day, but because they weren't spiritually ready. They had no forgiveness in their hearts. None. And he had come to die on the cross to pay for the penalty of sin. The people, they just didn't get it at all here. And so Jesus withdrew again to the mountain to be by himself alone. So he wants no part of it, see? And, <clears throat> and this is the connection here. Mark chapter 6, verse 45. We'll go back to our primary text now. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side, to Bethsaida. It's interesting that the word made, Jesus made his disciples, it's the same verb to force. The people were coming to force Jesus to be the king. Jesus then has to force the 12, get in the boat now. Why? What's the implication of that? They were ready to join the Messianic Revolution. They wanted him to be the king. They're ready to go.
He says it's not happening. It, it just struck me in my preparation. You know, there's some things that the Lord, I need him to force me to do. Because I face temptations. Lord, help me. I, I can't do this. I know this is crazy. Please, just help me. And we know uh, Paul's verse in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 about temptation is overtaking you, such as is common to man. In other words, we all go through it. God is faithful, won't allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also. And we think sometimes that means that we're never going to be tempted ever again. I don't think that's what it means because Paul goes on so that you will be able to avoid it so that you will be able to endure it. And I think what Paul is saying there is, listen, you're going to face very real temptations to gossip. Very real temptations to be self-centered. Think only about yourself. 101 other temptations. Prejudice, greed, pornography, the lying, the anger, whatever. And Lord, I just need you to help me. So, I do this, and then I do this. What's the universal sign of surrender? There it is. Please help me. I need you to do the impossible. I can't get through this. Please help me endure it. Is your heart open to it? We should be. He feels it. He instills vision, multiply resources, empowers resistance. Finally, let me wrap this up. He supplies abundant courage to trust him. Verse 46, after bidding them farewell, left for the mountain to pray while it was evening. Boat was in the middle of the sea. He was alone on the land, seeing them straining at the oars, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. Our time stamp, the way that we understand all of this, they're out on the water for nine hours, and they're straining. Literally, the, the Greek verb is to torture. They're being tortured in this trial. And Jesus walks on the sea. Only God can do that. Verse 48. This is a verse that I... Hard to understand. Verse 48. And he intended to pass by them. And when I read that, I thought, they're all struggling. They're being tortured in the boat, and he was going to, fellas. <laughs> and he was just going <laughs> to pass by them. And then I started studying this verse a little bit more, and it doesn't say that he was going to pass them by. It says that he was going to pass by them. And it's a very technical phrase that's used in the Old Testament of when God revealed his divine glory to people by walking in front of them and passing by them. He did it with Moses. He did it with Elijah. He passed by them. And he's doing it with the guys in the boat here. He's ready to reveal himself to them. And why did he do it? So that they would call him into their trouble. Please come and help us. Verse 
verse 49. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed that it was a ghost, and they cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. <clears throat> Why that response? Because they never expected Jesus to show up. You understand that? They just didn't expect him. So they panicked, but immediately spoke to them and said to them, take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Who's this for this morning? Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Do you look forward to 2024? Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. The message is pretty straightforward. I'm right here. I have all the power to do the impossible. So call me into your problem and let me give my courage to your discourage. When you are out of courage, let me encourage you. Let me bring my courage to you. Verse 51. Then he got into the boat with them, the wind stopped, and they were utterly astonished. Blew their minds, literally. Verse 52. For they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves. What? They got nothing out of the five loaves and two fish? Nope. Why not? Verse 52. But their heart was hardened. Petrified, it's callous, it was numb, insensitive, incapable of gas grasping the, the truth. Miracles do not create instant faith. The only thing that does is hearts that are soft and pliable. Is your heart really open to God doing something new and fresh? As you look out at 2024, can you trust him? Can you? We shall see, huh? We shall see. Because that's, that's really the fundamental question. Can we trust him? Is he trustworthy? Let me just tell you one quick story, and I'll be finished, promise. Um, years back, at a family from our assembly who were doing quite well. He was a, owned an engineering company, and then uh, 2008 hit. And if you remember the Great Recession and everything that went on, anyway, he lost his business. And... Um, they had just bought a real big piece of property out in Ramona. And uh, the mortgage was high on the place. He thought that he was going to be able to afford it, but now losing his job and everything, he, they were really up against the wall. He had no idea where food was going to come from, had nothing. So they were going through their savings and uh, no hope not a lot of anything. And on the property uh, out in Ramona, there was a barn. And in the barn was an old stand-up safe. You know those big stand-up safes with combination lock on the thing? It was in the barn. And he always wondered what was inside of it. And so he had time on his hands, so he called a buddy with an acetylene torch, and they came off, burned off the hinges. And that door fell open, and you know what was inside of it? An envelope. 
And in the envelope, true story, in the envelope was three $100 bills. Come on, somebody say praise the Lord. I mean, when you've got nothing, 300 bucks is a lot. You know, it wasn't like, you know, Berkshire Hathaway stock or it wasn't Apple stock or Google. It wasn't something. That's what he was hoping for. Three $100 bills. So he said, okay, well, we've got food for five days. I'm going to go tell my wife. So puts the envelope, money, and he's walking up to the house. And it was an old junkyard that they had bought, and stuff was always coming up out of the ground. And he's looking up ahead, and he sees something sticking out of the ground. And so he goes up and does what most of us guys would do. You know, kind of kicks at it with his foot. And he reaches down and grabs it, and he pulls it up. And it's a bracelet. Just a cheap plastic bracelet. And he cleaned it off. But on the bracelet, two words. You know what the bracelet said? Trust me. And he realized, the God of the universe has just spoken to me. He may not give me everything that I want, but he's going to give me everything that I need. And what I have to do is trust him. And so I told that story to our church family. A member of our church went out and made up these bracelets. I put Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6 on it. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Lord, you are in this. He'll make your path straight. Will you trust him? Just starts today. How's your heart? Anybody need Jesus here? First, first time, Jesus saved me. I've sinned. I'm sorry. I've made a mess of it. I want you as my Savior. Come into my heart. Forgive me. I'm just so sorry. Please. And if you haven't made that decision yet, I would encourage you to, but I would venture to guess that most of us are Christ followers here. We Trust in the Lord Jesus. The message from the Lord is, um, let your heart be open. And only you can determine that. So, let me just invite you to bow your heads with me. And I've talked a lot up here. Sorry for going long. All right, everybody just take a really deep breath, will you? And in your own mind, in your own heart, with your own words, you talk to the Lord. And I don't know what you need to say to him, but you say it. And if you make a new and fresh commitment, will you tell somebody about it? Either on that communication card or... And 
And I gave a handful of these red bracelets to Pastor Hal, and if it would help you to have one, see Pastor Hal, will you? But you have to tell him a little of your story to get one, and just one, what the Lord is doing in your heart. All right, let's conclude our time with this prayer for 2024 that's on the video. God of all creation, as we look ahead to another year, we look above to you. Your grace is enough. Your mercy is new every morning and your power is made perfect in our weakness. This year we have faced many trials. We have fought many battles. We have learned many lessons and we have prayed many prayers. But this is our hope in life and in death. You are the God who sees. You are the God who knows. You are the God who cares. And you are the God who loves. And so we pray for courage to face our giants. We pray for grace to cover our guilt. We pray for strength to overcome our challenges. We pray for joy in all circumstances. And we pray for vision to see what you see. We don't know what we will face this year, but we do know this, it will never be faced alone.